Uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, one, because this is a great series of programs that we've now been doing since 2012, which is hard to believe. Two, because as Jason mentioned, we did finally nail down all the different topics we're going to do for this program series next year in 2022. So we will continue to be here on the second Wednesday of every month to talk about various and sundry things regarded, uh, related to the Civil War. So that's, uh, that's exciting. And then the last reason, and probably the most important, that I'm happy to be here is simply that I haven't done one of these in a while. I've done some of them on, on Zoom, you know, when we started uh, kicking things back up on Zoom, you know, over a year ago. I have done a couple of those. But this is the first time I've been here to actually speak to a group of people sitting in front of me for almost two years. Um, so I do a fair number of these myself, and so I'm used to being here and talking to, to all of you or to groups that come, but it, it's been a while now. So this is, this is nice, too, to actually see faces again. And, of course, that also opens me up to things that you may decide you want to throw at me if you don't like what I have to say, but uh, I, guess, uh, I guess I have to take my chances here. So, so uh, I'm here to talk to you today about, as, as, as Jason said, um, some of the similarities and differences between two of my favorite presidents, and I'm sure yours as well, Abraham Lincoln and James Garfield. This is Mentor Ohio, so it's okay if Lincoln's not one of your favorite presidents. But if James Garfield isn't one of your favorite presidents, you're probably living in the wrong town, um, at least as far as I'm concerned. So we actually do have a number of things about these two guys that are similar, different you know, life experiences and feelings about certain issues that are similar. We also have some life experiences and and feelings about things that are very different as well. Hence the incredibly unimaginative title, <laughs> Lincoln and Garfield Similarities and Differences. So I will, as always, go through the slides, talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing and, and, and uh, expand a little bit on some of the things that you see on the screen. And then at the end, uh, I'll be happy to, to answer any, any questions you may have. So. Obviously, the title of this series of programs is Leaders and Legacies of the Civil War Era. And of course, these guys both are very much a part of that. Abraham Lincoln, of course, as the President of the United States during the Civil War, and James Garfield as uh, a soldier during the war, and then later a political leader during the Reconstruction period after the war ended, and then eventually as President of the United States himself. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of alternate back and forth so you can see some of these similarities and differences between the two. So Abraham Lincoln, uh, born famously in a log cabin in Kentucky on February 12, 1809. Uh, lost one of his parents at a very young age. His mother, Nancy, uh, died when he was about nine years old. His father eventually remarried, and he remarried to this woman named Sarah Bush Johnston, who had a family of her own. She was, all, she was widowed also. She had her own children. Uh, and this was in the era when, you know, we, we tend to think of marriage today as, you know, this, this kind of romantic love situation where two people meet and, you know, the stars align and, and they look at each other and they decide to spend the rest of their lives together. And there certainly was an element of that then. But marriage also, especially on the, the western frontier, which, frankly, Kentucky and Indiana and places like that where the Lincolns were living were at this time, that was the frontier. And there was a business element to marriage as well. Um, you know, men needed someone there to take care of the children, and women needed someone to provide for them to live. So there was, you know, marriage was a mutually beneficial uh, partnership. So when Thomas Lincoln's first wife, Nancy Abraham's mother, died, he very quickly afterwards started looking for a new wife. Not because he didn't miss his first wife, but because of this business aspect. He needed someone there to help him raise his children. Uh, Abraham Lincoln also had an older sister uh, as well. So, he was, so Thomas is looking for, uh, for a wife. He meets Sarah Bush Johnston. They decide to get married. And so she becomes Abraham Lincoln's stepmother. She comes with, uh, with, with children of her own, so Lincoln now has step uh, siblings. And he actually developed a very strong relationship with Sarah Bush Johnston, uh, his stepmother. And in fact, believe it or not, she was still alive when he was elected president. She was quite elderly at that point, but she was still alive. She did live long enough to see him, um, to see him uh, elected. So he talked uh, and wrote very fondly about his, you know, his own mother, Nancy, uh, when he got older, and then, but he also always had very, very kind uh, and generous things to say about his stepmother, Sarah Bush Johnston, as well. We all know the famous, uh, you know, line about Lincoln that, you know, he had less than a year of, uh, of actual schooling his entire life. Whether or not it was exactly less than a year, I'm not sure about that, but 
uh, this is one of those interesting historical tidbits that for the most part is accurate actually. We, we tend to think of these things as, you know, we find out later, well, that's not really exactly what happened. Well, in this case, yeah, Lincoln really didn't have a lot of formal education. His family moved quite a bit. They were in Kentucky, they were in Indiana, they went on to Illinois. But also he was growing up on, a, you know, on farms and there was a lot of farm labor that needed to be done. Uh, and so a lot of the times that, that other children perhaps would be in school, uh, a, kid like, a farm kid like Abraham Lincoln was, was being kept home from school because there was work to be done on the farm. So yeah, that in fact, Lincoln didn't have very much formal education. Uh, and so what he then later accomplished in life uh, becomes all the more impressive when, when you think about you know, the fact that he really didn't have very much formal education. So while he was very close with his natural mother, Nancy, who died, and with his stepmother, Sarah Bush, Johnston Lincoln, he actually didn't have a very good relationship with his, with his father, Thomas Lincoln. Thomas Lincoln was, was, you know, he was illiterate. He was a very kind of hard man to get along with, and he pushed his son very hard. He also didn't understand why his son, Abraham, wanted anything other than the life that he, Thomas, had. Why didn't he want to just, why wasn't he content with just being a farmer? Why didn't he want to work uh, hard at farm labor? Whereas Abraham very early on in life decided farm work was not for him. He wanted a different path. Uh, he loved to read. He was always borrowing books from, from, from other people. Read the Bible a lot because that was one text that even an illiterate family tended to have in their, in their home. Uh, so Lincoln decided very early on he didn't want to be a farmer, and that actually caught, and, and some other things too, caused some contention in the relationship with his dad. So, uh, in fact, uh, when his own father died, Lincoln didn't even go to the funeral. Um, so again, just a very kind of contentious relationship. This was not all that uncommon, really. Um, you know, we, we think that, you know, again, uh, just as I sort of, you know, jokingly talked about what marriage, what we think of as marriage, well, we think of these uh, child and, and, and parental relationships too, that you know all kids love their parents and they want to stay in touch with their parents and when they move away they come back and see their parent. It doesn't always work that way even today and certainly Lincoln was not that atypical really in having a, a strained relationship with one of his parents simply because he wanted to take a different path in life than his parents had taken. Today we encourage that probably quite a bit more but, but not quite as much at this point. So what about young James Garfield? Uh, also born in a log cabin, if you can believe that. In fact, uh, later when Garfield becomes president, he does have the distinction of being the last log cabin born president. So Garfield's born right here in Northeast Ohio, November 19th, 1831. So yes, his 190th birthday is coming up here in, uh, in a little over a week. Um, like James Garfield, I mean like Abraham Lincoln, excuse me, James Garfield also lost a parent at a very young age. In this case, it was his dad. Uh, Abram Garfield, and that's of course what the, J the A in James A. Garfield stands for, James Abram Garfield. Abram Garfield, his father, the future president's father, died when young James was only about 18 months old. Uh, again, they're living on the, what at the time was thought of as the frontier here in, in the, on the Western Reserve of Ohio. There's a forest fire. Abram is out fighting the fire. Uh, we think he probably not only caught whether it was a cold or pneumonia of some kind, but also there probably was some complications from th something like smoke inhalation from the fire. At any rate, he dies when the future president is only about 18 months old. So like Abraham Lincoln, here's a similarity, James Garfield loses a parent at a very young age. So James Garfield grows up in a, you know, primarily in a, what we would think of today as a single parent household with his mother, Eliza, who he is very, very close to for the rest of his life. And unfortunately, because of what happens to Garfield, she outlives him. His mother did briefly remarry, uh, but that ended up being a very, uh, a very bad relationship for her. There was, there's some, out, some suspicion that maybe there was some abuse, uh, domestic abuse going on. Uh, James Garfield did not get along with the stepfather. And eventually Eliza decided she didn't get along with him either because they actually divorced, which was quite scandalous in, you know, in, in the 18, probably 40s or so when this was happening, when, when Garfield was, uh, was in his early teens or so. Um, and there's later, much later, uh, in fact, it's when Garfield is president-elect. So this would have been between November of 1880 and March of 1881. So between his election and his actual inauguration, I think January of 1881 or so, uh, he writes this diary entry where he says in the diary entry that he just read the obituary 
of the guy that his mother was briefly remarried to. Uh, and the guy had ended up in Michigan and died up there. And Garfield makes the statement in this diary entry that he can never think about this man without contempt. Um, so he obviously held a little bit of a grudge there, even, you know, 30 some years later. <clears throat> uh, his mother was uh, opposite of, of the experience Lincoln had with his father. His mother was very interested in seeing James Garfield get a very good education. Um, you know, he grew up uh, as a young man kind of dreaming of, of leaving Northeast Ohio and going to sea and becoming a sailor. Uh, he eventually made it as far as the Ohio and Erie Canal, uh, where he worked very briefly before falling in the, the canal several times and eventually getting sick. Coming home, his mother kind of nursing him back to health, and then she insisting that he not go back to the canal, but in fact that he go get an education. So he agrees, uh, and then ends up finding out that he has a, a knack for, for studying and for, for education. And so he, he be, and embarks upon the life of a scholar, I guess you would say. He, he, uh, he, he goes first to the Geauga Seminary in, in, in what's now Chesterland. He goes on to the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute down in Hiram, that's now Hiram College, and then eventually on uh, to Williams College up in, in Massachusetts, where he gets his, uh, his bachelor's degree. Um, so other than that time he spent up in Massachusetts, the bulk of his, you know, the first several decades of his life were here in Ohio. So whereas Lincoln moved around quite a bit, you know, born in Kentucky, lived in Indiana, eventually ended up in Illinois, Garfield's pretty much in Ohio for the bulk of his life, except when he's in Massachusetts to go to college, or of course when he's, you know, in many different places when he's in the army or when he's in Washington, D.C. as a congressman. Ohio was always his residence. That was not the case for Lincoln, who moved around quite a bit. Uh, and as I said, he, he did have a very strong relationship with his mother. Um, if you come down to, to our site right down the street and, and you go take, you take the tour of the home, when we get to his mother's bedroom, because she did live down there with them for a while. Um, you know, we always kind of joked that uh, before you ask, no, he was not an only child, <laughs> because there's pictures of him everywhere. Uh, but of course, my, my follow up there is always, but he is the only one of her children that became president of the United States. So, uh, but anyway, he in fact did have three siblings, uh, but, but, um, but he's the only one whose picture you see in, in, in his mother's room. That also obviously speaks to the, the tragedy of his very early death as well. So as far as their early careers in politics, uh, Abraham Lincoln started his life as a member of the Whig Party, which obviously doesn't exist anymore. That was the forerunner of what became the Republican Party uh, in 1854 uh, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed and then kind of create, you know, necessitated the creation of a new party that became the Republicans. Um, Lincoln was, was very openly ambitious for office. He wasn't at all ashamed to appear to be ambitious. He wanted to be in, you know, in politics. He wanted to be in office. He kind of wanted to be part of the, the debate about these big issues. Um, Gar we'll see in a minute, Garfield wasn't quite, uh, wasn't quite that way. Uh, Lincoln did run for a number of offices in, in Illinois. He was, uh, he was elected as, sur as a surveyor for a while. Uh, and then he did end up serving a number of terms in, in the Illinois state legislature uh, as well. And then in the 1840s, he did serve in Congress for one term uh, as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, where, of course, James Garfield would later spend a lot of time. Uh, Lincoln uh, was part of this kind of almost rotation system where uh, all prominent members of a party eventually got their turn to go run for run for national office. And so when his turn came up, he ran for and was elected to the, the, the U.S. House of Representatives. He went there in the late 1840s and frankly was miserable. Uh, he didn't like Washington. His wife hated Washington and she actually took the children and left uh, and went back to Kentucky where, uh, where her family was from and basically said, I'll see you when you're done being a congressman. Um, and so after that, especially, he was very unhappy there. So he was more than happy to not run for re-election and to go back to Illinois after, uh, after his one term was up. The most notable thing that Lincoln probably did during that one rather, you know, undistinguished term was he spoke out very, very vocally against the Mexican-American War, which took place between 1846 and 1848. Uh, a number of Republicans and a number, uh, or I'm sorry, not Republicans, Whigs at this point still, 
uh, and, and Northerners primarily, Northern Whigs, uh, were very vocally against this war because they basically felt like it was a land grab by the South to try to obtain more land on which they could take, uh, they could take slavery with them. Um, so a number of very prominent people spoke out against the Mexican-American War. Lincoln was not all that prominent at this point, but he did in fact, uh, he did in fact give a pretty, pretty well-known speech on the floor of the House in which he kind of insulted uh, James K. Polk, who was president at that point and, and during the Mexican-American War. So, um, so anyway, that was probably uh, Lincoln's one claim to fame when he was, uh, when he was a member of Congress in the, uh, the late 1840s. Going back to James Garfield, and this is Garfield right here with his mother, his brother, and his two sisters, but this is the future president right here. Uh, Garfield grew up as a very devout member of the Disciples of Christ, uh, which is kind of a homegrown Protestant, uh, Protestant sect here in, uh, in Ohio. Uh, he initially, at least, was not really interested in politics, and even beyond that, he didn't really feel like it was appropriate for a devout Christian to be involved in politics. So, you know, how does somebody with that kind of a, of a mindset end up going into politics and eventually becoming president? Um, he, he, he certainly was an ambitious young man, and the thing that really turned him around and made him not only interested in politics, but also allowed him to kind of justify in his mind why it was important to be involved in politics was going up to, to Massachusetts and going to Williams College. So Garfield, as I said earlier, lived his entire early life on the Western Reserve of Ohio. When he was trying to figure out where to go to college, he actually made a very conscious decision to go up to Massachusetts and go to Williams because he said in a letter he wanted to get into that abolitionist atmosphere. So he knew that New England was kind of the, the heartbeat of the American abolition movement at that point, and he decided he wanted to be part of that. He wanted to know what it was all about. He wanted to experience it. And so he made a, a, a decision that a lot of people didn't expect. A lot of people expected him to go to a, a small school called Bethany College down in, it's now West Virginia, it was Virginia at the time, because it was, <coughs> excuse me, affiliated with the Disciples of Christ. So a, a lot of people assumed that's where he would go. And in fact, he said no, he wanted to, to go to, to Williams instead. So when he's at Williams, he starts you know, meeting a lot of other students who are from New England, from the other northern states, who are very vocally anti-slavery. And that's really the thing that makes Garfield suddenly uh, not only politically aware, but also able to justify in his own mind why he should get involved in politics. There's this great uh, diary entry he writes, November 2nd, 1855, where he, um, or maybe it's 56, 55 or 56, uh, no, 55, um, where he, he's talking about how he went to hear uh, some speakers that evening, and they were talking about the situation in Kansas. So if you know anything about Kansas, <clears throat> there was this, this sort of mini civil war almost out there called Bleeding Kansas for a few years really prior to the Civil War when, when anti-slavery and pro-slavery settlers are trying to get into Kansas and to make it either a, a slave state or a, or, or a free state. And so these two speakers came and they spoke at Williams College that night. And Garfield writes in his diary that night that, you know, he's, he's been awakened this evening to the political condition of the country uh, and says very, very uh, plainly uh, that he is, he is anti-slavery uh, and that this, you know, uh, I feel like throwing the whole current of my life into opposing this giant evil, meaning slavery. So he's now awakening to, you know, to not only to, to politics, but really primarily to, to the idea of, uh, of being an abolitionist. So he comes back to Ohio after he graduates from Williams. He becomes first a teacher and then the president of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. Again, now Hiram College, just an hour or so, what, south of us. Also during that time, while he's doing that work, while he's living that scholarly life that I referred to earlier, he also gets elected to the Ohio State Senate as a Republican. Uh, so he's elected to the State Senate in 1859. That is really at that point kind of a, a part-time job, if you will. So he spends part of his time down in Columbus as a member of the State Senate, and then the rest of his time up here living in Hiram with his uh, young and, and growing family. So he stayed in these two jobs at the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute and in the State Senate until the beginning of the Civil War. As far as family life goes, uh, 
Again, some similarities, some differences. Abraham Lincoln, of course, is, is famously married to, to Mary Todd, Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, they had four sons born to them. Only one of them survived to adulthood. So they lost three children at a very young age. Um, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was their firstborn child, was born just you know, less than a year after they were married, uh, is the only one that survived to adulthood. Um, Robert Lincoln eventually became well known in his own right uh, and eventually became Secretary of War uh, as well. So he did work in, in private industry. He was a lawyer. He was a businessman. Spent a long time working for the, for the, Pullman, uh, the Pullman Company in Chicago. Uh, and then also did do some public service as uh, a presidential cabinet uh, as a member, uh, as, as a, uh, in the position of Secretary of War, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now the Secretary of Defense uh, is what we would think of it today. And then uh, because Lincoln's, you know, three of Lincoln's four sons died young, never had children of their own, yes, Robert Lincoln did marry and have children, but that line has now come to the point where it, does, it, it doesn't exist anymore. There are no direct descendants of, of Abraham Lincoln left. There may be some, you know, kind of, you know, eighth cousin twice removed or something like that. I'm not sure, but I think they're all deceased at this point. So we don't really have any direct descendants of Abraham Lincoln left. James Garfield had seven children, uh, two daughters and five sons with Lucretia, his wife, and she is, uh, is, is right here. Tomorrow, of course, everybody knows tomorrow is Veterans Day, but tomorrow is also James and Lucretia Garfield's wedding anniversary. They married on November 11th, 1858. So uh, in, in addition to celebrating Veterans Day tomorrow, we'll be celebrating James and Lucretia's anniversary as well. Uh, of the seven children that were born to them, five of those children survived. So they did lose two children. So similar to the Lincolns, they did know the experience of unfortunately losing uh, children uh, in, in childhood. Uh, so five, five uh, of those seven children did survive. All eventually married. All eventually had their own families to the point where when Mrs. Garfield died in 1918, because of course, as you probably know, she outlived him by you know, about three and a half decades. Uh, she had 16 grandchildren by the time she died. Um, and there are still, of course, tons and tons of Garfields out there. So contrast that with Lincoln, where we think that there are no Lincoln descendants left. We have lots and lots of Garfields, including several of them who still live around Cleveland and we see down at the park all the time. They're involved in things we do, they come to our events, and they're just wonderful people who are really proud of their family name, understandably. Uh, and rightfully so. So just as, we meant, just as I mentioned that one of Lincoln's sons did eventually go into some degree of public service serving as Secretary of War, two of Garfield's sons did the same thing. Um, Harry Garfield, who was the eldest Garfield's son, uh, eventually worked in the federal government as the head of the Federal Fuel Administration. Uh, Harry Garfield was a lawyer and, uh, and also was a, a college professor, excuse me, <clears throat> and uh, Harry Garfield was recruited to teach at a little school called Princeton uh, by the president of Princeton at the time who was a guy named Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson recruits Harry Garfield to teach at Princeton. So Harry Garfield goes to teach at Princeton. Woodrow Wilson eventually leaves Princeton to go become governor of New Jersey, and then in 1912, uh, Woodrow Wilson is elected president of the United States. Then in Wilson's second term, he runs for re-election in 1916 on this slogan of, he kept us out of the war, and then immediately after winning re-election, we enter World War I. Um, and so when the U.S. entered World War I in, in early 1917, they created this, this uh, sort of temporary uh, agency called the Federal Fuel Administration, which was designed to, uh, to basically uh, ensure that the country had adequate supplies of fuel, coal primarily, and some other things too, both here in the country, but also enough to send overseas for troops who were fighting uh, overseas uh, in Europe during World War I. So just as Woodrow Wilson had recruited Harry Garfield to teach at Princeton years before, in World War I, he recruited Harry Garfield, the son of James and Lucretia Garfield, to come to Washington and run the Federal Fuel Administration, which Harry Garfield did. And then when, when the war was over, that 
the agency disappeared, didn't exist anymore, and Harry Garfield went back to his day job, if you will, uh, which at that point was no longer at Princeton. He was actually at that point the, the, the president of Williams College, the same place James Garfield had attended and the same place that all four of the surviving Garfield sons went as well. The other son is James R. Garfield, not to be confused with James A., of course. James R. Garfield, who was the younger brother of Harry, the second son born to James and Lucretia, uh, eventually uh, did a number of, of civil service jobs. He also was in the Ohio State Senate for a while, like his dad had been. Uh, he was a member of the, uh, the U.S. Civil Service Commission for a while. Uh, and then in, from 1907 to 09, he worked in the cabinet of President Theodore Roosevelt as the U.S. Secretary of the Interior. And oh, by the way, the National Park Service didn't exist then, but today we are an agency of the Department of the Interior. So there are lots and lots of great Garfield connections everywhere. So we have two Garfield sons who both worked in civil service uh, like their, their father had done. Uh, Harry Garfield, who worked for a Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, and James R. Garfield, who worked for uh, a Republican in Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson didn't like each other very much either, but that's a, that's a program for another time. What about military service? Uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, it's not well known, but in fact did have a brief period of military service with a militia unit from Illinois. Uh, and this was uh, in, in the early 1830s during what was known as the Black Hawk War. It was a, a conflict with American Indians in Illinois. Um, so he enlisted in this militia unit to, to go potentially fight against these, uh, the, these uh, American Indians. He was elected captain by his, by his, his peers, uh, and he often said that was one of the greatest honors that was ever bestowed upon him. That's high praise from somebody who became president of the United States. And the, the conflict was, was fairly brief and at least for Lincoln's unit, did not involve any actual uh, combat. Lincoln joked that he never actually saw an Indian throughout the, the entire Black Hawk War, and that most of his fighting took place with the mosquitoes, not the, not the, uh, not the Indians. So here's a big difference. We have a, quite a different experience in the military for James Garfield. So James Garfield, who we've already established, was you know, pretty strongly anti-slavery, um, never really called himself an abolitionist, but that's what we would call him today. Uh, Garfield fight, volunteers to fight for the United States uh, very early in the Civil War. Uh, the war starts in April of 1861, and Garfield is a, is a commissioned officer uh, in, the, uh, in the service of Ohio by August of that year, so just a few months lapse between the beginning of the war and when he actually is able to get himself uh, into the war. Again, he's still a state senator at this point. He's still the head of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. Um, but he feels compelled to, to, to contribute, uh, and so he volunteers to fight and uh, eventually is commissioned as a lieutenant colonel in command of a new regiment, which eventually becomes known as the 42nd Ohio. Uh, he helps raise this regiment, he helps equip it, and eventually becomes its commander as well. And a lot of the, the, the young men who volunteered to fight in this regiment were actually from Northeast Ohio, and a number of them had been his students at Hiram, uh, in the, at the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. So there, there, you know, he, did, he did have access to uh, a lot of young men who were willing to volunteer, and that's probably at least part of the reason that, that he was able to be commissioned as, a, uh, as an officer and, and to be put in charge of that regiment because he helped bring so many young men into the, uh, into the service. He didn't have any military background or experience. He, you know, we know he didn't go to West Point. Uh, he hadn't served in any militia units or anything like that, so he's really kind of learning on the fly here as he prepares to, you know, really start thinking about having to lead men into battle, uh, something he's obviously never done before. So he's, you know, he does what a scholarly, uh, a, a scholar can do, which is, you know, he pours through books, he studies Napoleonic campaigns, he studies textbooks, uh, he learns all about different, you know, infantry maneuvers and, uh, and things like that. Um, and, and you know, proves to be a, a, a pretty good commander, actually. Um, he wins a, uh, an early victory for the Union at a battle called Middle Creek down in Kentucky uh, in early January of 1862. This is the period when the war is not going all that great for the Union, uh, and they're, they're happy to latch on and celebrate any victory that they can get. Uh, 
So, you know, this, this uh, scholar from Ohio who has no military experience suddenly going down to Kentucky and winning a battle against a Confederate force led by a West Point graduate with twice as many soldiers as Garfield had, uh, that's a pretty big deal uh, in the Union press, for a while at least. Uh, and then, you know, some guy named Grant starts winning all these battles in the West in February of 1862 and suddenly uh, Garfield's pushed off the front pages. But at any rate, he, get, he catches enough attention that he gets promoted. So he, he starts as a lieutenant colonel. He's very quickly made the colonel of the 42nd. And then after Middle Creek, he's promoted to brigadier general, which is the rank at which he spends most of the rest of his time. He eventually becomes uh, uh, the chief of staff to the Army of the Cumberland, a major Union field army. Uh, and, uh, and that's where he stays until, uh, until the end of 1863. Uh, Middle Creek, Shiloh, and Chickamauga are the, two, are the three most famous battles at which Garfield fought. Middle Creek is really, frankly, not that well known. Shiloh and Chickamauga certainly are. Uh, he was uh, at, uh, at uh, Middle Creek, he commanded the 42nd Ohio. By the time of Shiloh, and he was commanding an infantry brigade and really didn't see a lot of action at Shiloh. He and his brigade arrived really right, on, right at the end of the second day when the battle was basically ending. And then Chickamauga, he was, the, he was not commanding troops at that point. He was a staff officer at that point. But he kind of made this very famous, uh, volunteered to kind of make this famous ride under heavy enemy fire out to another general to, you know, tell him what was going on, and that the army was retreating because, of course, Chickamauga ended up being a Union defeat, not a victory. And like a lot of Civil War officers on both sides, uh, he was often called General Garfield for the rest of his life. So uh, I don't know that he, I'm not aware that he ever asked anybody to call him that. It was just kind of a sign of respect for, for service during the, uh, during the Civil War. So how did these two guys feel about slavery, the major issue of the day? Uh, and of course, we've already talked a, a little bit about how Garfield felt about it as a young man. Lincoln is a little, uh, is frankly a little more complicated on this issue than Garfield ever was. Garfield's not perfect on it either, by the way, but, but Lincoln is a, little, uh, is a little more kind of all over the place. You know, as early as the 1830s, it was clear Lincoln didn't like slavery. He was personally opposed to it. And he you know, says here that as far back as the 1830s that slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy. Um, he was always morally, personally opposed to it. The problem for Lincoln was he didn't see a way for it to be constitutionally abolished. He did feel that, you know, as, as, as ugly as it was, it kind of was somewhat protected by the Constitution. But what he, so he didn't really feel like a president or a, or a Congress really could, uh, could just pass sweeping legislation to just say, you know what, as of tomorrow, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have slavery in the United States anymore. He didn't see that, that as, as a real option yet, at least. Um, what Lincoln felt needed to happen to slavery was that it needed to be contained where it was. He did feel that a president and a Congress could, in fact, stop slavery from expanding to new territories, but he didn't really see a way for Congress to, to legislate slavery out of existence in states where it already was. Um, and so that was kind of where Lincoln came down on slavery, really well into the 1850s, and really even as he was running for president in 1860. You know, a lot of Southerners liked to, to, to group all Republicans at this point into this, you know, what they called damned black Republicans, and they liked to try to scare people, and it worked, by the way, that say, by saying that, oh, you know, if a Republican wins this election, they're going to abolish slavery. And Lincoln had very publicly said many times, no, we don't really have a constitutional way to do that. Um, but Southerners convinced enough people that, that this was a problem. And so when Lincoln did win that election in 1860, of course, they started trying to, to, to secede from, from the country. Lincoln was not an abolitionist at this point, and he certainly did not feel that the black man was the intellectual or social equal of the white man at this point. Um, you know, and he very famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I, I can't recall the exact quote that, you know, just because I don't think a, a, a black person should be a slave doesn't mean I want to, you know, have a, a black woman as my wife or something along those lines. So, you know, he's saying that, you know, slavery is repugnant to him, but that doesn't mean that he believes in full and equal equality. He just doesn't think that, that, that African Americans should be enslaved. Garfield, however, 
was a little more radical on this issue, quite frankly. Uh, of the two men here, Garfield is the most consistent on this issue, more so than Lincoln. Uh, Garfield believed that slavery, slavery was illegal, it was immoral, uh, it was un un unconstitutional, and it was anti religious as well. You know, again, as I said earlier, he's a devout member of the Disciples of Christ. Uh, he has not only great legal concerns about slavery, but great biblical and religious concerns as well. James Garfield never called himself an abolitionist. Uh, we would call him that today, but that is not a term that he used. And I think that's probably because there was some very, very heavy political baggage with that word at that point. Uh, and in fact, the reason that Abraham Lincoln, going back to Lincoln here for a second, the reason that Lincoln was able to be nominated for president in 1860 by the Republican Party was because he didn't consider himself an abolitionist per se. The guy that everybody thought was going to win that, that nomination in 1860 was William Henry Seward from New York, who ended up being Lincoln's Secretary of State. Seward had been a vocal abolitionist for decades, and he had a very long record of speeches and votes in Congress that were anti-slavery. And Republicans were worried about that. They felt that that made him vulnerable to, to, you know, to attacks from the other side, and they didn't think he could win. And so Lincoln positioned himself very well to be the second choice in 1860. Uh, Garfield, I think for, for you know, not wanting to sort of be painted with that, with that brush, uh, never again called himself an abolitionist, but I mean, really, that's basically what he was. Again, he was far more uh, uh, firm on, on slavery than, uh, on, on being anti-slavery than, than Lincoln was. Now, Garfield's not perfect. He uses some, you know, he said some things and wrote some things privately that are not really, you know, attractive to us today in, in the current climate. Um, so he wasn't, you know, he wasn't perfect by, by any means. Uh, and a couple of those quotes I used there, you know, I could never get myself to fall in love with the creatures, meaning, meaning uh, black people. Uh, I refuse to pat the black man on the back simply because he is black, although that to me is not at all a, uh, a negative necessarily, but the, uh, but the, but the first one certainly is. So he was, he's, not, he's not, you know, perfect by any means, but he's far more consistent on this issue than Lincoln was. And perhaps most importantly, as a member of Congress for a very long time, Garfield is a very solid, radical Republican vote on civil rights. Lincoln and Garfield were also renowned as, as, as great speakers. Um, Lincoln, of course, you know, gave many speeches that are considered classics uh, today. <coughs> Excuse me, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, of course. The famous House Divided speech that he gave in 1858 when he was nominated to run for the U.S. Senate in, uh, in, in Illinois. It was that nomination that, that allowed for the Lincoln-Douglas debates because he was challenging Stephen Douglas, who was the, the sitting U.S. Senator from Illinois. The Cooper Union speech, which he gave in February of 1860 in New York City at Cooper Union. This is the speech that really a lot of people feel made him a viable presidential candidate. Uh, and he was nominated just, just three months later. The first inaugural, of course, where he, you know, he, he flat out tells the South, you know, you can have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressor. Um, you know, you, we're not going to attack you, but, I, you know, you haven't taken an oath to uphold the Constitution, and I have. Um, so, you know, very, very highly regarded. The Gettysburg Address, I mean, come on. It's, it's, you know, probably some of you had to... Uh, had to memorize that when you were uh, when you were in high school. I know I did because I went, grew up in, and went to high school in a little town called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So yeah, uh, that was mildly important to us there uh, when I was growing up uh, many many moons ago and 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 learning about American history. Uh, and then finally the second inaugural, uh, which again is 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 the the speech where Lincoln starts trying to put the country back together because at this point the war is 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 coming to a close and it's almost certain that at that point the Union is going to win, and now he's got to turn his attention to how is he going to put the country back together without animosity and, and you know, um, ensuring equality for, for African Americans, but also making sure that white Southerners feel like they're, they're being brought back into the fold. Obviously, a lot of those things didn't happen because of what happened to Lincoln. Garfield is also highly regarded as a speaker. 
Um, he, was, uh, he was in Congress for 17 years. He, he was elected to Congress originally while he was serving in the Army. Uh, so he actually left the Army at the end of 1863 and took a seat in the House of Representatives. And that's where he stayed until, uh, until 1880 when he was uh, elected to the presidency. So, uh, but very highly regarded as a speaker um, uh, during his, his many years in, in Congress. In fact, he was so highly regarded even at a young age that um, in the first, the nation's first National Decoration Day ceremony, Decoration Day is now Memorial Day. Uh, the very first National Decoration Day ceremony was held in Arlington National Cemetery, uh, May 30th, 1868, and James Garfield was the keynote speaker for that. Um, he was invited there by uh, a guy named John Logan, who was also a former Union general, uh, also a Republican, also a member of Congress from, from Illinois. And uh, Logan knew very well Garfield's uh, eloquence and, and ability to speak, and so he invited Garfield to give the keynote address to that, uh, to that important ceremony. In 1880, James Garfield was elected by the Ohio legislature to the U.S. Senate. This is before we, the people, actually elected our own senators. That didn't come about until the early 20th century. So in Garfield's time, the state legislatures elected U.S. senators. So the Ohio legislature in January of 1880 elected James Garfield to go in early 1881, a year later, to back to Washington, but not as a member of the House of Representatives, as a member of the U.S. Senate. So Garfield goes in, in June of 1880, just five months after he's elected to the Senate, but before he takes office as a senator, he goes to Chicago to the Republican National Convention, and he goes there to nominate someone else to run for president in 1880, to be the Republican presidential nominee in 1880. That someone else is John Sherman, who's from Ohio, the brother of William Tecumseh Sherman, the famous Civil War general, the March to the Sea and all that. Uh, John Sherman was a longtime Ohio senator and for the last four years before 1880 had been serving as uh, Secretary of the Treasury under President Rutherford B. Hayes. So Garfield, Sherman supports the Ohio legislature uh, electing Garfield to the Senate and in return he wants Garfield's support for his Sherman's uh, attempt to win the, the presidential nomination in 1880. Garfield says, okay. <clears throat> he goes to Chicago. He gives a very, very well-regarded, very powerful speech nominating John Sherman to be the Republican presidential nominee in 1880. However, none of the major nominee, the major candidates at that convention, including former two-term U.S. President Grant, uh, are able to, they don't have enough, none of them have enough delegates to win the nomination. So people start looking for a compromise candidate. And eventually people start thinking back to that speech that Garfield had given for Sherman a day or two before, and they suddenly start thinking about James Garfield as the potential compromise candidate of the Republican Party. So like Lincoln in 1860, in 1880, Garfield is nobody's first choice. Uh, you know, Lincoln, as I said earlier, positioned himself very well to be everyone's second choice, uh, as he said, so that if they fall out of love with, you know, or, or, or they fall out of, out of fas infatuation with their first love, they shall be compelled to come to us, or something along those lines. Uh, Garfield is not anyone's even second choice. He ends up being the 36th choice, because it takes the Republican Party 36 ballots to name a, a presidential nominee in 1880, and on the 36th ballot, they nominate James Garfield. Um, and so Garfield truly is something, of, something of, <coughs> of a surprise. There were a few people before the convention who thought maybe something like this could happen, uh, but uh, Garfield didn't put any stock in that and certainly was, was genuinely surprised when it happened. And it was really his speaking ability and specifically that speech for Sherman that, that made people think of him as a possible compromise candidate. So one of the most prominent similarities between Lincoln and Garfield is, of course, they're both president of the United States. They're both Republicans. Uh, Lincoln is the first Republican president. The Republican Party is only formed in 1854. Uh, so the party is only six years old when, when, when Lincoln is elected. And so they are a new party. The fact that it only took them six years to get somebody uh, elected president is, is amazing. Um, in 1860, of course, because of the, the threats about uh, the damned black Republicans and, and the potential abolition of slavery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, Lincoln didn't win any southern states, and in fact, in a lot of southern states, he wasn't even on the ballot. Uh, 
They didn't even put him on the ballots. Um, so he did not win any southern states. And in fact, he actually won a minority of the, uh, of the popular vote because there were so many other candidates running. Lincoln was the only Republican, but there was a northern Democrat and a southern Democrat and a, and a, and a third, fourth, fifth party. Um, so all the Republicans voted for Lincoln, but everybody else split their votes. And so it was almost guaranteed that Lincoln was going to win uh, the election. He's reelected in 1864. Of course, Southern states didn't vote then uh, because they were they considered themselves seceded. They were you know they were no longer part of the United States, and the Civil War was still going on. So uh, so so Lincoln wins two elections, two national elections for president, without any real support in the in the South at all, other than just a few you know a few votes here and there. Uh, today, you know, both both major parties still, you know, think of themselves as the true heirs of Lincoln. You know, Republicans still call themselves the party of Lincoln. Democrats call themselves that too. You know, we've certainly had some shift in party philosophies over the years. Whereas, you know, in Lincoln's time, the Republicans were really kind of the what you would think of today as the progressives, if you will, uh, and the Democrats were the conservatives at that point. You know, those philosophies have obviously changed, but both parties still uh, still consider themselves the true heirs of Lincoln. And uh, I will not speculate on, on which of them is right and which one is wrong. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just avoid that with a 10-foot pole. Thank you very much. Um, Garfield, of course, also a Republican president. Uh, he's the 20th president and the, f and the, uh, the fourth Republican president in a row. Uh, I'm sorry, the fourth Republican president and the third Republican president in a row. You have to remember Andrew Johnson, who took over after Lincoln, was actually a, Dem a Southern Democrat. He was not a Republican. Um, people tend to think he was a Republican because he ran at, for vice president with Lincoln in 1864, but in fact he was a Democrat. So Garfield's the third Republican president in a row, and the third Ohioan in a row, by the way, to, to become president as well after Grant and Hayes. Um, Grant, by this point, you know, was really more uh, of a, a resident of Illinois, but in fact had been born in and spent his boyhood in, in Ohio. Uh, as I said, you know, he was, Garfield was a compromise candidate in 1880. Um, he, he, he won the popular vote in 1880 by, and I kid you not, less than 10,000 popular votes out of millions and millions of votes cast. He wins by that small of a popular vote margin. So you can see things are starting to change in the country uh, by the time 1880 rolls along. Garfield wins uh, a very, very, very narrow popular vote margin. He wins a you know, pretty significant victory in the Electoral College but the popular vote victory is minuscule. And oh, by the way, he's the only Republican in something like five straight elections uh, to actually win the popular vote. Because, um, of course, uh, Grant won it in 1872, but then in 1876, the Democrat won it, Samuel Tilden, but he lost the Electoral College. Um, 1880, Garfield wins it, but barely. 1884, Grover Cleveland wins it. 1888, Grover Cleveland wins it again, but loses the Electoral College to Benjamin Harrison. And then in 1892, uh, Grover Cleveland wins it again. So Gre Cleveland, a Democrat, won it three times in a row. So Garfield's the only candidate in like five elections, only Republican candidate who actually wins the popular vote. And even his popular vote margin is very, very narrow. Like uh, Lincoln, he did not win any southern states. Um, you could say, you know, if I had that, I should have put that map in here. Um, there's a great electoral map from 1880 that shows, and they even use the red and the blue, like, you know, we have the red and blue states today. Um, they even use those same colors to show, you know, Garf the North was solidly red for Garfield, and the South was solidly blue for the Democratic candidate, who was Winfield Scott Hancock. And of course, Garfield never did have the opportunity to run for re-election in 1884, because the final similarity, of course, sadly, is that both of these guys are assassinated. Uh, they're both Republican presidents. They're both assassinated presidents. Lincoln, of course, Lincoln's assassination on April 14th, 1865, is kind of thought by many as the sort of the last, the last real uh, uh, tragic act of the Civil War. The war actually went on for a couple of months after this, but at any rate, John Wilkes Booth, who was a, a native of Maryland and, and was a, a strong supporter of the Confederacy, decided that the best way to avenge the South uh, was to kill Lincoln. Now, in fact, what John Wilkes Booth should have done was made sure that Lincoln was as healthy as possible because Lincoln was the guy that was wanted to treat the South fairly and have a very, very lenient reconstruction. When he killed Lincoln, 
that dream died uh, because Andrew Johnson became president and, and, and he did not have the same uh, political skill or support from the Congress to, to institute this lenient system of reconstruction and that's where we then get congressional or radical Republican reconstruction which is very very harsh on the South uh, and so in fact uh, Booth you know really killed the South's best friend in, in Abraham Lincoln so we shot Lincoln at Ford's Theater on the night of April 14th Lincoln lived about another nine hours but never regained consciousness uh, died about nine hours after being shot on the morning of April 15th uh, Booth, of course, escaped and was on the run for, I don't know, I think 12 or so days uh, before being captured in Virginia and, and killed by federal troops. <clears throat> Garfield is only president for about four months before he gets shot. Uh, he is shot by a guy named Charles Guiteau, who actually considers himself a Republican. Um, there was a lot of factionalism in the Republican Party at this point. Guiteau came from a different faction of the party than Garfield, and Guiteau, who was also, by the way, extremely mentally unstable, uh, believed that Garfield was, was dangerous to the Republican Party and therefore to the country, and that the, the logical thing to do, of course, would be to kill Garfield uh, and to elevate Chester A. Arthur to the presidency, who was Garfield's vice president, because Arthur was from the right faction of the party. So he shoots Garfield in a train station in Washington on July 2nd, 1881, doesn't kill him. Garfield actually lingers for about two and a half months, uh, probably would have lived as he, at, had his doctors believed in germ theory uh, and had known better to, than to stick their dirty hands and fingers inside his, his wounds. They have introduced infection into his body and that's what eventually killed him, not the bullet wounds. Uh, Guiteau, unlike Booth, was immediately captured uh, really didn't make an attempt to escape. He, he just gave up and said, yep, I did it, and I'll go to jail for it, and Arthur will be president. He was tried, he was found guilty, and he was executed June 30th of 1882, two days shy of the one-year anniversary of his uh, attack on Garfield. I think today, uh, Charles Guiteau would almost certainly be found uh, not mentally competent to stand trial. I think, or if he was tried, I think he would be found, you know, he would have a very, uh, a very strong uh, case for, t for, for uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. So he was definitely mentally ill. And then finally, remembrance. What do we remember about these two? Lincoln is revered as the greatest president in American history. Sometimes the second greatest, depending on which survey you're looking at. Some people put Washington, then Lincoln. Most put Lincoln, then Washington, at any rate. Um, he's revered as, you know, one of the, probably the greatest president in American history. And he is, to my knowledge, still the second most written about figure in human history, second only to Jesus Christ. So Lincoln is highly, highly, highly revered and regarded today by most. James Garfield, um, until recently, has not been quite as, as highly regarded or quite as well known. Uh, Garfield, again, is president so briefly that a lot of people kind of view him as, as, as kind of a footnote in American history. He also has the unfortunate distinction of having been president during that period when there were lots of presidents in a row who all kind of looked the same. You know, they all have beards and nobody's quite sure who, which is which. In fact, Garfield is now starting to get more attention, and I'd like to think that at least some of that is because of the work that we do down the street. Um, because. Uh, people are starting to realize, oh, you know, this was somebody who, of course, was, was possibly, you know, literally brilliant uh, because of, you know, his, his academic background. He was incredibly intelligent, um, but also that, you know, he was someone who was, was quite ahead of his time on, on a lot of issues. Not every issue, but a lot of issues, especially regarding race. Uh, and so he's someone that, that people are kind of turning to now saying, oh, wow, this is somebody who we didn't know that much about and now we actually find to be really, really interesting and, and would like to know more about. And so that's why we're down the street, hoping that people will come see us. So there's been some, some recent books on him. There have been, there's been a documentary uh, on PBS about five years ago. So there are a few things here and there that are making people a little more aware of, uh, of James Garfield. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. See you next month.